That's kind of code an idiot would have on his luggage. I'm gonna change the code on my luggage. All right, so I don't want any examples. Hang on, I need a mallet. I had a bunch over here. There's a mallet. Rubber. Rubber. Yeah, three. Three <laughs> boxes. Maybe they're the ones I left last night. So, we've got a couple of different designs here for you guys to check out. Okay. Let me round this real quick and then we're going to talk about some layouts. Yeah, that's the one I made last night. So once we get the corners off, remember we want to be in that seven to 800 RPM range, okay? Don't get too crazy, we don't want to go in too fast, but we want to have it fast enough that we can get that nice clean cut. What I want you guys to watch here, okay, is my hand in my body position as I'm making these cuts, okay? Okay. This is how you have the most control of the gouge as we're making this cut. Okay, it's not very much of a finesse position though. Okay, it's more of an aggressive. We're gonna hold on to the gouge and not have it come out of our hands. Okay, once we start to use this as a shaping tool, okay, I bring my right hand right up to the ferrule. Okay, my left hand still pinches. Okay, but the difference is that my right hand is not driving into the wood. My right hand is driving into my body. Okay. So my right hand is pushing into my body, which makes me engage my hips. It makes me engage my whole body as I come across. Okay. So by being in this position, it makes you do the lay thing. Okay. Because there is absolutely no way that you are going to be able to get this gouge out here and be able to control that with your hand at the ferrule. Okay, so get that up against your body and just come right across. We're almost around. mark here right in the middle okay so that's going to define between the head and the handle on the mallet okay now when you are thinking about your layout here okay, you also have to think about the direction in which the mallet is sitting okay we want to think about the mallet in this position just like that okay we want to have the head of the mallet towards the headstock and the handle towards the tailstock because this is gonna give us a lot less vibration, all right? If I try and turn this piece in this orientation, yeah, it can be done, okay? But you're gonna really be fighting this wood down here on the handle because you're gonna have all this mass towards the tailstock that's gonna be flapping around, okay? So the first thing you always wanna take away from mallets is that whenever you are doing a project, goblet, mallet, things like that, that are gonna have the top that's heavier than the bottom, the weight always goes towards the headstock side, okay? So, now that we know which side is going to be which here, all right, I am going to take my, uh, my parting tool, I'm going to come into the right side of this line, okay, and I'm going to take my groove or my recess down to about two inches, okay, and I say about two inches because I'm not going to get a set of calipers and put it on there, okay. I know that two inches is a generally good size to start with, but I know that I'm going to have to come down a little bit more after that, okay. So we got a four inch blank, we got to take it down to two inches. How deep do I have to make that recess? I got to make it an inch. There's no way I can do that in a single pass, okay? So you're going to see that I'm going to widen this recess a couple of times so that I can take it down to two inches safely without having that tool bind me, okay? 
Right hand back, left hand pinch. Remember, we want to start with the tool flat. We score with the nose. Drop that tool handle down, push in. Let that tool peel. So you see that bounce? That bounce tells me that it's just about to pinch, okay? So that's when I know that it's time to work my way over and open this recess again. roughly two inches. Like I said, I'm not going to measure it, but I know that that's about a two inch diameter that's going to be good to start. Okay. So now we're going to get rid of the rest of that wood. We're going to use the rusting gouge again. Okay. You guys remember this technique? Yeah, it's a step cut. That's all we're doing here. Okay. I want to be able to get my gouge in here without hitting the head side and ruining this edge, which means I'm going to have the flute facing my body so that I can get that wing all the way up against. And then I'm just going to work from that middle towards the tailstock, removing this material. one of the first problems with mallet, okay? If I keep using this tool rest in this position, I have to keep leaning further over to be able to make this cut. The further that I lean over, I'm no longer rubbing the bevel. Now I've got the tool flat and I'm just scraping with it, okay? So remember, keep this tool rest moved so that we can get it as close as we can to the work. So, now I got my rough diameter set there, okay? Now, I'm kind of assuming that this is gonna be the first thing at college here that you guys, or tool-wise at least, that you are making for yourself, okay? So this is really where we wanna fit this handle to our hand, okay? As you were saying the other, uh, a little bit ago, big fatty, okay? Sometimes when I make these for the college, I have a tendency to leave the handle bigger than I normally would for myself, okay? I got some small hands. This one, we're actually gonna take this one down a little bit because I was told that one was too big. Okay, so take that down just a little more and then we'll start shaping. But shut it down often and check to make sure that it's of a good diameter that's gonna fit in your hand that you're gonna wanna use. <laughs> Yeah. 
Let's stop that before I make it too small. Oh yeah, that's a much better size. All right. So, there's our mallet, okay? Whenever we are turning pieces on the lathe like this, okay, we always want to try and work from the tailstock towards the headstock, okay? Which means that this first cut that I'm gonna make is gonna be this half bead right here, going down towards my live center, okay? Now, when we make this cut, remember that if we run into the drive spur of the live center, they're gonna win, okay? So only get as close as you feel comfortable coming down here, all right? But the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do this half bead right here so I can get that cut out of the way. A little bit of layout on the handle okay no matter which one you're doing whether it's the bead or the cove you want to know where center is okay we want to know where our high point or our low point is going to be okay so we know this is five so let's put a line right here at two and a half so now we know where center is all right so now i'm going to cut this elongated bead right here okay i'm going to start here on the edge, and I'm gonna slowly start nipping away until I get to the center, okay? And then I'm gonna work this side after, okay? But I wanna get this side all done first. Oh yeah, you guys remember this demo. Now you know why we do the taper with both the spindle gouge and the roughing gouge, okay? Because to try to do this taper with a roughing gouge, it's a much too big and aggressive tool, okay? We have to have a finer tool to be able to make this cut, okay? But you're gonna see when I do the head that I will use the roughing gouge to make this taper cut, okay? Because I have more room and I'm removing more material. See how that's feeling. Well, it probably won't be too bad. Okay, so you'll always see that on the end, okay, we leave just this little bit of, for lack of a better term, kind of a mushroom there. Okay, we want something that can catch the end of our hand while we're swinging this. Okay, we don't want to just have this bead go all the way off the end and then all of a sudden we're using the, the mallet and it comes flying out of our hand. Okay. <laughs> You gotta watch out for that, because the first couple I made, I did that with. So, now that we've got that end done, okay, now I'm gonna start the elongated bead on this side. You notice that I didn't make it all the way to the pencil line yet, okay? Once I get this side set, then I will fare that in, in the middle, okay? But I need to have this here so that I know where my center is.
that's coming along. We'll get that a little more. Now, a couple of people, especially in the Wednesday class, a couple of people here have asked um, how to keep that cut nice and consistent, okay? How do I get that nice fair curve, all right? Now, you guys have been turning long enough that, you know, we're going to start talking about line of sight, okay? When I turn, okay, I watch the gouge enter the cut. After that, my line of sight goes to the horizon. Okay, there's absolutely no need for me to watch that tool. I know what it's doing. I, as much as I love watching those chips come off, it doesn't benefit me to look at the tool as much as it does to look at the horizon. Okay, and I kind of affectionately, uh, you know, give the example of driving your car. Okay, if you look at the hood of your car, you can't see what's coming. Okay, it's the same thing with turning. If I'm looking at the tool, I can't really see the shape that I'm trying to create. Okay, but if I watch the shape being created up here, it's gonna make that tool and my body move much easier, okay? So once you come in and you set that gouge and you start seeing the chips peel off, bring your, aisle side, uh, your line of sight up here, okay? It's gonna help you to make that fair curve, okay? That's not a bad shape. I think we're gonna leave the handle right there. So, any questions about turning the handle? No? Didn't think so. All right, let's get on and do the top of this thing. So, we're gonna do that drop. Okay, now I'm not gonna measure it. I'm not gonna try to caliper this from a full diameter down to anything. I just know that I'm making a taper here, okay? The only layout that I do have to do, okay, is my little bit of back cut right here. So we do that little bit of back cut so that we don't get what's called short grain, okay? If I were to make this and take this cut all the way to the top and have this just come straight across, okay? I have little bits of grain that are sticking like that, okay? If I happen to hit that, this is just gonna break off, okay? But if I get rid of that now, okay, I have much less risk of having this little bit short grain on it. Plus what it does is it now takes the mass from the end of the mallet and brings it in about a half to five eighths of an inch, okay? Because we don't want that mass all the way out at the end. We want it closer towards the middle, okay? So I'm going to do a little layout line right here of a half inch. Oh, man. No. How can it be low battery? It's plugged in. Maybe it's not plugged in. <laughs> All right. So line right there at half. Damn, I'm going to lose my ambrosia. I knew it. All right. So line at half an inch for our back cut. All right. And now we're going to do the taper. Bless you. Remember, after you get that taper started, okay, we want to angle that tool rest, okay? I don't know if you guys could kind of notice, but right here at the end as I was finishing, I'm starting to get just a hair grabby, okay? That tells me that I'm starting to flatten the tool because I have to overextend to keep cutting, okay? So now we're going to just taper that, or we're going to angle that to match the taper. Now we won't have to deal with that.
Looks like pretty good paper right there. All right, so now we've got the handle made, okay, we've got most of the head turned, okay? The next thing we need to do is work on our transition right here, okay? You notice we don't want to just leave this dead flat, okay? We want to roll this over a little bit, and what we're looking for is somewhere that your hand can sit up against, okay? It's nice and comfortable for when you're working. So we don't want any sharp edges, nothing like that. I've seen guys who like to put their finger right up against it. I really like to get it right up against my hand like this. I even see some guys who use them upside down. Okay, but you want to make sure that this has a nice gentle edge that fits well up against your hand. Okay, if there's a little line there, you're never going to want to use this for long periods of time. So, spindle gouge. <laughs> Just like that, okay? And remember that that is just that um, V-cut, okay? It's the one that we used when we went to make the dovetail to put into the four jaw chuck, okay? I didn't open or close the flute, 40 degrees to the work, skewed about 10 or 12. All I did was pick the handle up, engage that lower wing so that I could make that slicing cut coming downhill, okay? Now I'm gonna do the same thing up here on the top, okay? So 40 degrees to the work, Skewed about 10 or 12. I'm gonna engage this left side, which is the lower wing, and all I'm gonna do is pick the handle up and make that slicing cut. two things you will notice about every mallet here in the shop okay every mallet here in the shop has a flat spot okay so that you can set it down okay one of the worst things about a mallet is when you round both ends and then you're chasing around the shop most of the time okay <laughs> the other thing you will notice is that they always have the centers left on them okay because if we ever need to we can put these back on the lathe true them back up and clean them up okay if they get beat up too badly okay so that's why i always suggest that you guys leave your centers so that if you happen to have a problem and i don't mean you know anytime soon but i've had my mallet for a decade now i've returned it twice okay so leave those centers so if something happens you can get it back on the lake okay so any questions about cutting and shaping this guy no nothing all right two Oh, we're not done yet. Oh, we got some more we're gonna go over here. So I gotta find the rest of my stuff. There it is. Okay, two. Sanding. Tonight is the first time that we're gonna go over sanding, okay? Kind of as I said before, with your spindle work, I don't want you guys to sand your spindle, okay? I wanna be able to see them. I wanna be able to know that you're cutting in the proper direction and that you're not trying to clean everything up with sandpaper, okay? You gotta have a mask, first thing, okay? I've got my crappy little dust be gone, only because it's easy to talk through while I'm doing this demonstration. It's gotta have something while you're sanding, okay? As we stated earlier, the worst thing about the lathe is I can't get out of the way of the dust, 
okay? So I gotta take care of myself here, okay? So, with the lathe, okay, the theory is that we cut as fast as we feel comfortable, okay? Now, we're not all Jimmy Clues, we're all not gonna be turning the lathe at 3,000 RPMs, but as fast as you feel comfortable, the faster, the cleaner cut we're gonna get, okay? Whenever we sand or drill, we turn that speed down, okay? When we sand or drill, we want to be somewhere between three to 400 RPMs, okay? If we try to sand or drill at high speed, okay, we end up producing a lot of heat and friction, okay, which is the last thing that we want, okay? Um, we talk about drilling, you know, if you ever notice on a drill bit, they say that they're designed to be run at high speed, okay? That's because the drill bit in a drill is actually spinning and the wood is staying still. Okay? We use it in the exact opposite way here on the lathe. Okay? I don't want that piece of wood spinning at 2,000 RPM the way that I would want that drill bit spinning at 2,000 RPM. Okay? And because we're drilling into end grain, we risk creating a lot of end grain checking because of the heat. Okay? Now sanding does the same thing. Okay? If I sand this at the same speed in which I cut it, okay, all I'm going to do is heat up the wood. You're good. All I'm going to do is heat up the wood. Okay, and I am going to actually close the grain as opposed to opening it up. Okay, you guys ever seen anybody that's got a crappy, blotchy finish on a piece? You guys can admit it. Come on, we all seen one where you walk up to a piece, it looks gorgeous from far away. You get there and it's got spots and cloudiness in it. Okay, that's because whoever made that piece overheated that sandpaper as they came across and they burnished that wood and they closed it. Okay. I tell this story. I took a class with Glenn Lucas once. Glenn is probably the finest production wood turner in the world. He comes up to me and goes, oh wow, you got a nice cut there, Rope. He goes, I bet you start sanding at 220. I was like, damn, I felt all proud. I was like, oh, yeah, you know? He goes, I bet you get blotchy, crappy finishes. I kind of stopped. I was like, how did he know that, you know? He was the one that taught me this. He's like, because you're getting such a clean cut, the back of the tool is actually burnishing the wood. It's closing that grain, okay? Then you're just taking 220 sandpaper, you're running it over the top of it, it's not opening that grain back up, okay? So no matter what I am working on, no matter what I am doing, I generally will always go back and start with 150 grit, because that opens up the grain for me. I know that it will evenly accept finish and I won't end up with any cloudy or blotchy spots, okay? So that's part one about sanding, okay? Turn that speed down, okay? Part two of sanding, right? Is the always, or, okay, first off, you guys ever notice how a lathe has forward and reverse? You ever wonder what reverse is for? There's no way I would ever stand on the back side and turn, okay? And this thing is designed so that if I'm on the back side and the lathe is running in that direction, the chuck on screen. Okay. The only thing that reverses, therefore, is for sanding, okay? Because if I put my hand here and I spin it towards myself, oh, that feels good. I made a nice cut, okay? But if I put my hand up top and I spin it backwards, we call that petting the cat backwards, okay? Every hair that we didn't cut that got laid down, you can now feel, okay? If I keep sanding in the same direction that I've been cutting, all I'm doing is taking those hairs and I am mashing them back into the wood, okay? By starting in reverse, I am then gonna cut all of those hairs so I can get down to a nice clean surface, okay? And I'm telling you if, you, if you take nothing away from this demo except for that, that will save you a ton of time in your woodworking. All right, I'm not gonna sand this whole thing, but I'm gonna sand a little bit so you guys can see the demo. Come on. I want you guys to think about sandpaper just like a small saw blade, okay? Just like with the saw, if I don't give the curve or the space in between the sand time to clear out, all I'm doing is producing heat, okay?
okay? So you will see that I will constantly be moving this and not just keeping it in one spot, okay? I have to let that dust get out of the sandpaper so that it can do what it's supposed to. Also, I want you to notice this. I didn't just move the tool rest out of the way. I take the tool rest, I get it right out of there, okay? I never want to have anything in here in which my body could get stuck in between the piece that I'm sanding and a piece of metal, okay? So whenever you're sanding, whenever you're drilling, take that tool rest right out, get it right out of your way. You all right? All right, so that was reverse. Now, now I'm gonna do the same grit, but going forward. So I would go reverse and then forward with the same grit. to 180 okay I want you guys to come up here and feel the difference between a 180 surface and a surface straight off the tool I gotta get the next part ready but feel the difference between that handle and that head Kinda, this truck feels kind of big to me. Oh, yeah, wow. For his hands? Yeah, for his hands. To me, that, that's still kind of thick to me. Seems like kind of a good size for me. Got strength. All right, you guys are talking about embellishing. Okay? Tonight, we're going to show you how to do some line burning, okay? Oh, yeah, maybe the warm sun here real quick. All right, so first tool, new tool we're going to introduce you guys to, spear point scraper, okay? This guy's only purpose in life is to create a little recess for us, okay? We're going to use this piece of wire to burn a line. You guys know what this is? Okay. One of the great things about us having a guitar repair and setup class, we get all their old guitar strings. And they make wonderful line burners because they come in a bunch of different diameters. Okay. Now, if I were to take this and just put it on the wood, okay, what's going to happen is it's going to skate all over the place until it finds the softest piece of grain. And that's where it's going to burn a line. Okay. That could look kind of cool. But really, we want to be precise. We want to know exactly what we're doing, okay? So that's what we use the spear point for, okay? With the spear point scraper, okay? You want to use this tool in what is called trailing mode, okay? Trailing mode means but the back side of the tool is higher than the tip of the tool, okay? We have it in this position so that if anything happens, the tool falls away and doesn't ruin our work, okay? We can use the tool flat, okay? If you drop the handle on this tool like you do a traditional gouge, I guarantee that that mallet's coming off the lead, okay? You have this giant aggressive cutter coming straight uphill into the grain, okay? Best 
okay, don't ever do it. Now I'm not going deep here. Maybe about a sixteenth of an inch, okay? Just enough so that I have somewhere to lay that wire into. All right, just like that. Same thing, line burning, get rid of the tool rack, okay? When we are doing this, okay, we need to have the lathe going as fast as it'll go, okay? We need that friction to create the heat to do this, okay? You're gonna see that I'm gonna have my chest right up here, up against the headstock, okay? One hand in front, one hand in back. I'm gonna drop this in the groove, I'm going to pull straight down towards the bed of the lathe. Right there. All right. Now, you shouldn't have to say it, I say it every class. Don't touch the wire after you have done this. Inevitably, somebody will, okay? But it's very hot. So, you can see now that we got a pretty decent line there, okay? But we have a little bit of what we call overburn, okay? You can see a little bit of charring. On this one, you can even see a little bit of yellowing, okay? I'm gonna come back with my 220 grit, the last one that I finished with. And I won't even do both of them. I'll just sand the one so that you can really see the difference. Okay? That looks a little floppy. It's got a little bit of that overburn. But when you clean that up, that line becomes very sharp. So, questions, comments, concerns about balance? Nothing? I've done this demo too many times.
good round out. I mean, now we've got some extra ones, but let's round it in. Thank you. 